How about welcome home? For those of you who are new to community development, our next moderator took an emerging national nonprofit organization and oversaw its exponential growth that raised and invested more than $3 billion in private capital in inner city and rural communities nationwide. Other points of call during his career include serving Boston's mayors Kevin White and Raymond Flynn, head of Boston's Neighborhood Development Agency and Employment Agency, and for the past 10 years, it's 10 already, but then again, I stopped counting. And then for the past 10 years, president and CEO of the Boston Foundation, one of the nation's oldest and largest community foundation. Author, friend of community development, and one of our own extended family members, please join me in welcoming Paul Groban. Well, thank you very much, Richard. It is, uh, it is a homecoming for me, and uh, uh, the fact that this organization is so vital and so robust and doing such great things across uh, America is, as you would imagine, uh, a source of, uh, of great pride uh, for me. And uh, I do get to work with LISC. Uh, uh, we're deeply engaged in some very exciting work with uh, uh, Boston LISC uh, in our city. So uh, uh, I've had a chance to, uh, to, to see a number of you already, and I look forward very much to the, uh, to the evening uh, and a chance to, uh, uh, to connect some more. But be between now and, uh, and this evening, we have uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, hear about what's happening in urban communities uh, from uh, those who, who feel it most, the mayors uh, on the front line. And we have uh, four spectacular uh, political, uh, urban, urban political leaders uh, to hear from and to converse among themselves and to take some questions uh, from you in, uh, in due course. Before I introduce them, um, I thought I would take the privilege of the uh, moderator and, uh, and say a few words uh, myself. Uh, as I contemplated uh, this session, it occurred to me that there is both uh, great news about cities uh, and bad news. You know, when I started with Kevin White, uh, one of Tom Menino's illustrious predecessors and himself a legendary four-term mayor, I started in 1975 as a very junior assistant. Boston and American cities generally were in a very, very different position. Hemorrhaging jobs and people uh, to the suburbs, depicted again and again as the repository of all of America's uh, intractable and unsolved problems of poverty, crime, blight, racial tension, and so forth. In other words, cities, in a way, were synonymous with failure. As an emblem of that time, I like to tell the story about Faneuil Hall Marketplace, which I imagine many of you uh, have, have visited. Um, in 1975, Kevin White and the legendary developer Jim Rouse were trying to get Faneuil Hall Marketplace revitalized, and they ran around to all the great financial institutions in Boston, and we had a great many headquarters financial institutions in those days, far more than we have now. And of course, they got meetings with the CEOs everywhere they went. Uh, but guess how much financing they were able to raise from Boston's hometown banks and insurance companies and so forth? Not a single dime. The city's business leaders were voting no on this exciting project, not in some low-income neighborhood, but in the historic heart of the city. That was how complete and pervasive the pessimism about the American city was. In effect, they were told, Mayor, we understand your intentions are nothing but the best, but this will never fly. But as we know now, things have really turned around. There are troubled cities still, and even the best cities uh, have tough problems to deal with. But what a shift there has been, both in the condition of cities and the perception of them. We now seem to understand that over 80% of the United States population lives in metropolitan areas. 90% of the gross domestic product is produced in metropolitan areas. And the very idea of the cities, the distinctiveness of, of urban life, 
has enjoyed a comeback with significant parts of our population, aging baby boomers, young people, uh, young families, young single people, uh, wanting to be uh, in the vital cities uh, of, our, of our land. It is really uh, an extraordinary uh, turnaround that has happened in the space of 30 years or so. And I don't say 30 years accidentally because LISC and everything it represents has made a mighty contribution to both the reality and the perception of the urban turnaround in America. Because the neighborhoods that LISC and its partners have targeted, at least at the beginning, had been given up for dead. And what a story it's been to see so many of those neighborhoods uh, blossom uh, again. Boston, my hometown, thanks in no small measure to the extraordinary mayor on our panel today, is will become one of the most vital cities uh, in America, uh, if not the world. And it is a great commercial for the difference, for the distinctiveness, as I said, uh, uh, of urban life. We even have books such as Ed Glazer's new book, Triumph of the City, how our greatest invention, cities, makes us richer, smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. These were not the kinds of books being published about cities. Uh, 25 to 30 years ago. Of course, about 11 years ago, there was another optimistic book about cities. <laughs> Perhaps a little ahead of its time. We don't have to talk about that. So th there is a tremendous amount of good news here that opens up uh, great opportunities for the future. But as we know, there is bad news uh, as well. And it's right on the pa pa front page of today's New York Times below an absolutely lovely picture of Elizabeth Taylor is the headline, States Pass Budget Pain to Cities as Cutbacks in Services Cascade. The state budget squeeze is fast becoming a city budget squeeze as struggling states around the nation plan deep cuts in aid to cities and local governments that will almost certainly result in more service cuts, layoffs, and local tax increases, and so forth. Every one of the four states in which our four mayors reside are in pretty significant financial trouble, and that is being passed on uh, to them. But in a kind of terrible double jeopardy, simultaneously, uh, the federal government uh, is, uh, appears bent on cutting uh, the domestic discretionary uh, spending, despite the fact it represents only 12 percent of the budget, and no amount of cuts to that category of federal spending will represent any kind of a solution to the nation's fiscal woes. So they, they are dealing with that double jeopardy, and they are at the tail end of a giant game uh, of crack the whip. And one of the things we want to explore with our mayors is how they're dealing with that, how they are taking things forward in the face of such adversity and so forth. But I want to start with a question, and I'll, I'll give you the question, and then I will introduce our mayors. And the question is going to be, what does it feel like? to be you these days, to be a mayor, getting up every morning, dealing with the issues in the city. What are the priorities? What's on your mind? What, in fact, is keeping you up uh, at night? And to address this question, we have four, as I said, incredibly distinguished uh, urban political leaders. To my immediate left is the Honorable Heather McDear Hudson, the mayor of Greenville, Mississippi. She is a true daughter of the Mississippi Delta, born and raised in Greenville, Mississippi. She was elected mayor in 2003 and re-elected for a second term in 2007. She serves as the first African American and first female to serve in her position, and she's honored to be one of the youngest mayors within the National Conference of Black Mayors. To her left uh, is our mayor from St. Paul, uh, Minnesota, whose notes I have here somewhere. Mayor Chris Coleman took office in 2006, was re-elected in 2009 as the 45th mayor of St. Paul, bringing a wealth of experience to the office as an attorney, a community and neighborhood leader, an investment advisor, and a city council member. He has also been guided by his experience as a lifelong resident of St. Paul whose family has deep <coughs> roots in the community. He has put bridging the education gap at the core of his agenda. To his immediate left is my mayor, uh, Tom Menino, who is a political colossus. He has been reelected to his fifth consecutive four-year term, breaking the all-time record the job, for continuous service uh, as mayor. As I mentioned a moment ago, uh, he has uh, reshaped the city 
uh, in uh, countless ways, but uh, the, the results are there for all to see. I was asked by Boston Magazine to make a prediction for 2011 in their end of the year issue, and my prediction was that somewhere in the city this next year, a successor to Mayor Menino will be born. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, from the West Coast, we have uh, um, Mayor Kevin Johnson of uh, Sacramento. He was elected mayor of Sacramento as the 55th mayor of that city in November 2008. He is the first native Sacramentan and the first African American to be elected to that post, and his vision is for Sacramento to become the city that works for everyone. So why don't, Mayor Johnson, we start right with you. What does it feel like to be you these days? It feels pretty crappy. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I'm the mayor of Sacramento, which is the capital of California. And when I ran for mayor, um, there were some things that became very apparent. Number one, in terms of public safety, our city um, was the second most violent city in California behind only Los Angeles. Number two, our unemployment rate was at double digits. Our foreclosure rates were some of the highest in the country. Again, I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, furthermore, when you think about our school system, which are the staples of, of good cities, you can't have a great city without great schools, the majority of our schools are not meeting the targets for, for California. So again, our schools aren't working well, our unemployment, people don't own homes, and our safety is an is extreme challenge. On top of all that, um, California is one of those states that unfortunately balances, I should say, or attempts to balance its budget on the backs of cities. Th that's not good news for any of us. I, I say all that to say within all the challenges, there's an opportunity. And uh, the newest mayor of Chicago, uh, Rahm Emanuel, when he was working for the president, said you cannot squander an opportunity to make a difference in your community. So while we have a host of challenges, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities. And, uh, but that's actually what it feels like today. It sucks. But that's <laughs> mayor Menino, same question. Well, I tell you, um, Paul, um, thank you for the introduction. You know, as mayor of the city for the last uh, 18 years, um, I still have the excitement of, um, of being mayor, and it's, it's a challenge every day. As mayor, your life changes every hour. You have seven challenges out there that you have. Budget issues are a big problem now because there's no partnership with federal government, state government. Education is the biggest challenge we face because we don't educate our children to, that we have no future. And so as mayor, what you have to do is bring people together great collaborations in your city to make it work. You can't do it alone. Any mayor or any CEO who wants to do it alone is going to be a failure. I, as mayor, always look to bring people in. You know, Boston Foundation with Paul Heads, we asked them to help us on several issues. But one of the things we've got to understand is that we have to get to the people. It's about the people. It's not about these issues that the, the uh, folks in Washington want to talk about. How do we help people every day? I'm a minority majority city, and how do we make sure that diversity becomes the strength of your city? And that's what I try every day, and work with different segments of Boston. When it comes from education, public safety is another one. How do we allow America to have so many handguns in the, in, in, with young people? Why can't we do something about it? I, I, I had a coalition up with Mayor Bloomberg in New York. We have about 350 million as part of it. What, why don't they get it in Washington? I don't, I don't want to take guns away from hunters. They, they want to go get Bambi, let them go get Bambi. I don't care. <laughs> I want to get guns away from 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds. Just this afternoon, a 14-year-old kid was shot in, in the city. The question of the press is, what happened, Mayor? Why did the question be, how do they get the guns? Where did that gun come from? We've got to face up some of these tough issues that are destroying our inner fabric with young people having guns out there. That's a real issue that the elected officials in Washington don't want to deal with. Why? Because an NRA spends $2 million a year lobbying against changing legislation. If you want to be a hunter, go be a hunter. 
But I just say, that as mayor, I get excited about this job every day, but I, my priority all the time is the education of our children. If kids get educated, they have a future. Thank you. Mayor Coleman. Well, I don't know if it's a coincidence or, or by design that the four of us are all uh, representing the cities that we were born and raised in. And so um, while I don't disagree with Mayor Johnson that it can feel kind of crappy at times, uh, <laughs> It still is pretty exciting to be the, the mayor of the city that I was born in and I, that I'm just passionate about. So it's, it's challenging times. Um, I found that the easiest way to deal with it is just to pretend like you didn't really hear what the legislature was saying. Um, <laughs> it, it's so much, it's, it's, you know, it's like your grandparent that would just turn their hearing aid down when the kids came over and just smile through the whole encounter. Uh, because that's, the, the reality of it is we're sitting here at a time where there's a, uh, and I think you know it's it's across the country, but maybe nowhere more obvious than it is in Minnesota right now that there is a target on the back of the three largest cities in, in Minnesota: Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth. There is a very specific proposal that takes away state funding only from those three cities, uh, and from no other cities. As a matter of fact, they tried to take funding away from the suburban communities. The suburban legislators got mad and said, "No, no, no! Just take it away from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth." Um, you know, so it's so I. People say, well, are you angry about that? And I said, you know, it's, it's not even worth getting angry because it's so ridiculous. And I'm going to pretend that those cuts aren't going to come. I'm going to pretend that our governor, uh, we were fortunate to not have the situation that you saw in Wisconsin because uh, we did have a, 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 a governor that was elected that did understand the importance of cities. And he said he's going to put a, a stop to what the legislature is trying to do. We'll see how it plays out. Uh, I pretend just to ignore it until I actually have to deal with it. It makes me very happy. Thank you. Try that one. <laughs> uh, you, the, the question you asked is how does it feel, and, and I think for me it, it's, it's humbling. And I, I say that because in spite of everything that's going on, we all realize that the people we represent have elected us to be leaders at such a time as this. And that means that they've put into us a, a level of faith that says we trust that you're going to do the right thing about the situation that we have right now. Now, I represent something a little different from my colleagues in that I'm the only rural community here. I represent Greenville, Mississippi, which is in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. In Mississippi, there are only three cities in the entire state that are over 50,000 people, so our entire state is rural. And for all of my friends from the Blues Festival out there, I know you all will be coming back to see us. Hi, new <laughs> And see, they know what I'm talking about. That should let you know. You should come on in Mississippi. I haven't gotten an invitation you got, yet. You are, everyone is now officially invited to the Mississippi Delta Blues Festival in Greenville, Mississippi, the third Saturday in September. But I, I say humbling, and I, I take it back to the fact that in the Mississippi Delta, we are at generational level of having to deal with the same problems over and over and over again. I hate to say it, but to be in a recession is nothing new to us. We live in a recession. Our life is a recession. The levels of poverty, the level of miseducation, uh, the level of uneconomic development that we have dealt with in our community and that we deal with in the communities across our area are, are something that unfortunately we've learned how to be resilient against. We've learned how to overcome. So as a mayor, for me, it's humbling that my constituents have put me into a position to say, okay, we trust that you're going to do the right thing. We trust that you're going to listen to what we have to say and then take that in order to develop and form what are good resources in order to help us bring come up to the next level. In the meantime, we're going to keep doing what we've always done, and that is we've been getting by. Thank you. Um, wanna want to ask you, you, you each what, what your top priority is and, and, and what you're trying to do about it uh, at the moment. And uh, Mayor Menino, you've already uh, said what yours is, so I'll call on yours. you first. It's education. Uh, you are uh, in charge, uh, unlike many mayors of, of public education in the city. You played a major role in passing uh, landmark legislation last year. Uh, what's got you so excited about, uh, about the education opportunity in Boston right now? Well, uh, Paul, um, as mayor of the city, I, I have an appointed school board, which every major city in the country should have. It takes the politics out of the schools. We have an elected school board. All they answer to is the unions, the custodian union, the teachers union, because they pay their campaign expenses to get reelected. 
my school committee members couldn't get elected to the dog catcher. <laughs> all they care about is the education of our children. <coughs> and that's what the schools should be all about. And, you know, I've taken over a school system that was in complete disarray uh, 18 years ago when I brought in some real good superintendent schools. We're being fought for pilot schools, which initially was more, more prominent than China schools are today, which broke a lot of the management rules. I negotiated that with the teachers' uh, union. And then also we went to the legislature this past year to give us flexibility in the schedules of our schools and also be able to move teachers from school to school without getting into the union nonsense. Uh, well, we have to go to the union first and get there okay. And also longer school days. But also what we did was we create some programs for our, uh, the diverse population of Boston, like newcomer schools. When people come to Boston from another country, we have a special school for those kids so they can learn English and learn math and reading so they go into our system. Also, we create uh, parents' universities for our, kid, for our parents so they know what the parents should accept in our schools. And also one we recently did was Success Boston. We found out we sent a lot of kids on to college, but they weren't graduating. And I uh, put a, a study out there. I knew I'd get my head kicked in, but I wanted to see the results in black and white. So we got the results showing that only, I think, 29% of the kids graduated in four years. It took them six to eight, nine years to get done. So what we did was the foundations, and Paul was part of that foundation, uh, foundation group, came together. We have a program. Kids who graduate from the Boston Public Schools and go on to a college, we put them into a program in the summer so they get the benefits of understanding what they would expect when they go to college. We've had for the last for three years, we've seen an immense improvement in uh, what's going on with the children in the Boston Public Schools. They come back to us during the course of the school year also. But also what we're doing is a lot of technology in our schools, and, uh, and that's a really important part of it. Uh, you know, our, our computer labs, uh, and a lot of our schools now, we have that for that children. The uh, president came to Tech Boston a couple of weeks ago to see uh, our technology school and how well we're doing there. And, but also trying to understand what the needs of those children are. You know, education, uh, I go on for an hour on this one, doesn't start when a kid gets to the first grade. It starts when the kid is born. We have to think about how we start, you know, th th I have a program, Thrive in Five. Start when the child's born, help them with the vocabulary, have the parents read to them, make sure they get the medical help. So when they get to the fifth grade, they have all this behind them. It's not new going to schools. Also, we created a four-year-old program, full day kindergarten for kids. Because when I became mayor, we had half day kindergarten. Let me tell you what it was. The mother dropped the kid off in the morning. The kid took a half hour to take the coat and jacket off, get a cookie and milk, and sat down for a half hour. They did the same thing over again. While the mother went to the fitness club, and, uh, but I said, that doesn't work. So we created a full day kindergarten for K1 and K2, and we see results. We see our test scores going up in our schools. We're not perfect, let me tell you, because we take in all our kids. And we, you know, the other thing is I want to make perfectly clear. You know, we have pilot schools, which are negotiated with the teachers, teachers union, regular ed school, public, uh, public schools, the charter schools, parochial schools, and private schools. I don't care what school it is as long as a kid gets a good education. That's our goal, is make sure every kid gets a good education in Boston. That's, that's all our goals, and not about the building, it's about the child and how they have a future. Thank you. Mayor Hudson, top priority and what you're trying to do to move it? Uh, we have three major priorities. Um, they are, and they all, they're cyclical, they all go together. Education, I think that it's been well established here. Uh, infrastructure and jobs, they all go together. In our area, we have had such a lack of infrastructure building that we've had to put a lot of focus into just the base infrastructure, streets, <coughs> roads. I include broadband in that because I think that if you don't have a good broadband infrastructure, you're not pre preparing the community for what is the next generation of jobs and economic development. Uh, in my area, uh, we had roads and streets that had not been done for 50 years. So we put together a plan uh, to do in three parts pull together the infrastructure base. The first part was the city to invest in our own infrastructure. We did a $10 million bond issue. Now, for a lot of the larger cities, $10 million isn't a lot of money. For a city that's got 40,000 people in it, $10 million goes a long way. We partnered that with a state program as well as with the federal program 
to ensure that we were leveraging those dollars. So where the city took the $10 million to do neighborhood streets, we worked with our state partners at the Mississippi Department of Transportation to try to do <coughs> state aid roads during the same time period and work with our uh, Senate delegation in order to get federal dollars to help do some of the major thoroughfares in our area. What resulted was a lot of work um, that happened over a short period of time is actually still going on and we could see those dollars at work, the tax dollars at work. It did tremendous amounts for our community because neighborhoods and areas that had never had street repair had an opportunity to see uh, investment happening in their neighborhoods every single day. Uh, we saw some great things come out of that. Greenville is one of the first cities in the state of Mississippi that's used asphalt recycling. Well, that's, that's wonderful because it's a green technology, it's a green product, and we're able to use uh, and, and get more done with less. And I think that's the type of things that cities have to look at in this day and age. Um, we've been able to allow and, and show our industries and our businesses, hey, we're investing into our infrastructure base, we're investing into things that are going to continue to see our communities grow. We're investing to, into our neighborhoods, and we're not just doing it alone. We're partnering, we're putting together packages of how these things will help to progress our communities as opposed to saying, oh, we're just gonna lay one neighborhood street here. No, this is a part of a, a larger group. I think that when we do that, Cities then, uh, I know for, for our area in the Mississippi Delta, uh, we're not only going back and correcting problems that should have been done years ago, we're properly planning and forecasting into the future the direction that we need to go. As we have a good and solid infrastructure base, we can then have a good and solid economic development base a good solid job space to attract jobs into the area. Uh, from there we can work better to, uh, I think, really invest into education, which is uh, another entirely different topic, but one that I think certainly needs to uh, be explored because education in the Mississippi Delta is a vital, vital need. Thank you. Mayor Johnson, top priority and what you're trying to do to move it? Yeah, I think the, uh, the economy and stimulating jobs is, is one in education, and they go hand in hand. Uh, I'm going to piggyback on what Mayor Menino said. For me, it's education for our children. That at the end of the day, um, you cannot have a great city without great schools. And that has to be at the forefront of what every mayor does. You know, I talked you know, jokingly about the challenges that I, I was embracing as a mayor, but the opportunities are overwhelming as well. Uh, we all envy Mayor Menino here because he actually controls his schools. Uh, Mayor Coleman and I chair and vice chair a, uh, a task force for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and that's in relation to Arne Duncan and the president. And our commitment is to try to figure out what is the spectrum of mayor involvement in their schools. So the very basic level is mayors aligning their city services with their school districts. At the very end of the spectrum is where mayors control their schools. They can appoint a school board, they can appoint a superintendent, they have some influence over the budget. That is all of our dream, but we don't all have that flexibility. So that's what our commitment is, is doing. So as a mayor on the national level, and I'll bring it back to the local in a second, uh, we took on through the U.S. Conference of Mayors a very interesting uh, policy called LIFO. Has anybody heard of LIFO? Can you raise your hand? So nobody in here has heard of LIFO. It's called Last In, First Out, and it's seniority-based layoffs. Have you heard of that? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, the whole room knows that one. So basically you have in our country, and it happens at the state level and happens locally, that you have school districts and superintendents laying off teachers based on seniority and not based on performance or quality of work. None of us would run a business, none of us would run a city when you have to make choices like that. That's just not good policy for children. So as it relates to Sacramento, we're kind of creating a commitment in Sacramento where we make decisions based on kids, so kids come first. Number two, great teachers in every classroom. Number three, parents deserve choices. Number four, you invest in what works. And number five, you measure and reward results. That seems like you know, no-brainer type of things that you should be doing, but it does not happen in most cities around this country, and we've got to change that dynamic. So very specific in terms of Sacramento, 
just to give you one data point, we, we believe in a portfolio of schools, we believe in all the things that we've talked about up here, but I want to use third grade as a, a key indicator for children. In Sacramento, only 39% of our third graders are reading at grade level. Only 39%. What that essentially means is that 61% are not reading at grade level. If kids are not reading at grade level, by the time they leave third grade, 80% of those kids never catch up. How can a young person's future be decided by the time they're in third grade if we talk about this American dream? You guys know that if you, don't, if you can't read, you're not going to graduate high school, you're not going to have earning power, you're not going to go to college, you're not going to have a meaningful career. But the correlation of third grade reading ties to criminal activity. In Sacramento, two-thirds of young people that come in contact with our judicial ju juvenile system, two-thirds are illiterate. So you have an environment where if kids aren't reading at grade level, they're going to be involved in the penal system. That is not good. Three states in our union are building prisons based on third grade reading scores. Prisons are being built based on third grade reading scores. That's a correlation. We have a chance to disrupt that at, at an early age. So what we're doing in Sacramento is we started a campaign basically called third grade reading, that we want to create an environment that every kid in Sacramento, by the time they finish third grade, can read at grade level. That's big, that's bold, it's doable. Mayor Menino talked about it. It starts with school readiness, zero to five. <coughs> then it talks about student attendance when kids get into kindergarten through third grade, and then summer learning loss, what happens in the summertime. So that's just one quick data point in terms of Sacramento. We have a long way to go, but mayors don't have an opportunity. It may not be in our job description, but we have a moral obligation to make sure that we have an impact on our children and our schools. Well, I've never understood why the uh, most powerful and top political executive is not responsible for the most important public service, but that unfortunately is still true in a lot of cities. Mayor Coleman, your top priority and how you're moving? <clears throat> well, I, I was thinking about it as I, if I was actually to divide my day in terms of how much I spend on what particular area, uh, Mayor Menino would understand this better. Right now it's snow plowing. Um, <laughs> on, Unfortunately, we have both <clears throat> six inches of fresh snow on the ground at the same time the Mississippi River is, is heading towards a record crest. So uh, the reality of is, you know, the, the, the challenge for us as mayors is we, we want to focus in on these really important long-term structural issues and we, the day-to-day -day stuff becomes overwhelming uh, as well. But education, 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 uh, it is absolutely critical that we integrate everything that we do uh, whether it's community redevelopment, the Central Corridor Light Rail Line, which is a, which is a, the will be the, one of the largest transportation projects <laughs> in the history of the state, which is under construction as of just this month. Uh, uh, everything that we're doing in our libraries, everything that we're doing in our parks and rec center with community-based group, based groups, faith-based groups, is all integrated ultimately to the achievement issue that that we face. Minnesota is a, is a, is is really kind of a remarkable and, and in some ways a troubled state because at the same time we have one of the largest rates of attainment, one of the highest graduation rates from high school, one of the largest rates of postgraduate uh, education, et cetera. We have one of the largest achievement gaps in the, in the country. In the Twin Cities region, we have, we have the highest uh, discrepancy in unemployment rates between the white community and communities of color of any place uh, in the country. Uh, and so we have this reputation as this really progressive state, this really highly educated state. Our economy is based on a very highly uh, educated workforce, and yet we have this huge achievement gap that if we don't change, the demographics are going to overwhelm uh, our ability to put a workforce together to, to work for 3Ms and Medtronics and Boston Scientifics and all of the other companies that we have. Um, in the city of St. Paul, we've done a few things. I don't control the school district. Uh, I wish I had more authority to appoint the school board as other mayors have. Uh, I think it is a critical question, just to, if nothing else, just to uh, have a central accountability, have somebody say, it's your responsibility to do this uh, or, or, or to not do it. Um, but we've also said we, there are so many things that we can do as the city that don't involve direct uh, time in the classroom. It's setting up that whole structure of out-of-school time programs setting up that whole community-based support, make sure that what's happening in the schools is reinforced during the course of the rest of the day, on the weekends, during the course of the summer. Uh, very fortunate to be one of the 21 communities in the country out of almost 400 applicants that received the Promised Neighborhood Planning Grants from the uh, Department of Education. 
we're working very aggressively on making sure that we put that plan together, uh, hopefully to receive some additional implementation funds. Uh, in addition to the focused neighborhood that the promised neighborhood uh, is, is uh, in around two schools, we're dividing up the entire city into what we call learning campuses to really identify all of the resources that can connect to the schools to say, how can we make sure that a child who leaves the building at 2.30 or 3 or 4 in the afternoon has a safe place to go where they can get tutoring or mentoring, get a bite to eat if that's necessary, uh, engage in a whole lot of extracurricular activities that uh, relate uh, directly and indirectly to education. Uh, it doesn't have to be a math mentoring program or an English mentoring program. Uh, but if you can incorporate some of the lessons into a art-based program, if you can incorporate what's happening in the classroom into a, uh, a music program or a sports program, et cetera, et cetera, we think that we can get a lot out of existing resources if we just focus them more. So we really want to take all of the things that we do in the city of St. Paul, uh, short of mayoral control, uh, and just say we are going to step up and play our role to make sure that there's that 24 hours of support that the children need to be successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you know, going back to sort of just the basic conditions uh, under which you're operating, you all came into office, I'm confident, with uh, agendas, with bold plans, but then things happen. Uh, I remember uh, heavyweight champion, former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson used to say, everybody who fights me has a plan, then they get hit. <laughs> uh, and, Mayors get hit. Uh, you know, we, we talked about the cuts uh, a little bit at the start, but do you feel that <coughs> you spend most of your time reacting to things over which you have no control, or, or are you able to, to wrestle uh, with that uh, to, enough so that you're feeling like you can move ahead proactively and not be completely diverted from the ideas that you came into office with? Who wants to answer that? I, just following on your analogy, I just watched the fighter, head, body, head, body. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that they were talking about the hits that I'd be taking. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was going to be my strategy. Um, one of the examples of that is we had uh, a, a program that we launched in, in my initial year in office in 2006 called Invest St. Paul. And it was really to take off, uh, take, kind of build on the work of so many community-based organizations and so much good work that had occurred, including our work with LISC. Uh, over the years to really kind of take this to the next level to say, okay, we've stabilized our neighborhoods. Now let's really make sure that every one of our departments is when they're, when they're planning a sidewalk, planning it in a way that connects children, uh, safe routes to school, make sure that they're, you know, healthy, make sure that they have, play, you know, ability to walk to grocery stores, et cetera. Making sure that everything was aligned uh, to kind of take it, uh, to really uh, move beyond kind of just, you know, a project here and a project there and have a comprehensive approach to neighborhood revitalization. And then the mortgage foreclosure crisis hit, and boom. I mean, we were we st one step forward and about 10 steps backwards. That has been really, really difficult. So, you f so the, the challenge is, we, even when we were able to identify resources, uh, the, the, the game changed so dramatically with that foreclosure crisis that it, it just overwhelmed our ability to kind of uh, implement those long-term and comprehensive strategies. So then you, you, know, you kind of stabilize through the, 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 that process. Uh, and then, you know, the, the state cuts and the federal cuts and the CDBG, you know, uh, proposal that the Republicans in Congress have put out to just strip that program away. Uh, even cuts uh, proposed by the president, although, although, you know, not nearly as significant. Uh, it is just a, it's a constant challenge because we as mayors, I think, you know, and we know our communities, we know what we could do with the resources, with the concerted effort, with the community-based groups that are, that are so supportive of that. Uh, and then you're dealing with those outside circumstances that you can't control. I think that's the greatest frustration of being mayor right now in 2011 is there are just so many forces outside of your control that you're just, you're struggling to keep up. Anybody else? Uh, mayor I, I think you absolutely have to keep moving forward with the ultimate goal in mind. Uh, I'll speak to something we're all dealing with right now, gas. I mean, the, the, just because gas prices go up does not mean that your fire trucks and your police trucks don't run. They still have to run. They still have to respond. How do you deal with that? Um, I know when we had the gas crisis uh, that came before, when I first came into office, let me step back. When I first came into office, we were dealing with a $4 million budget deficit. No one know, knew this, including myself. 
Um, <laughs> so you can imagine my surprise, you talk about taking <laughs> head and body shots. Uh, you can imagine my surprise when I come in and they tell you, you know, you, have, you, have, you don't have $4 million. You need to try to find that in order to even catch up. Um, we were able to do it. We were able to do it. We, we, we got our budget into a good position, and then what do you know, we get hit with a gas crisis. Well, luckily, we had taken uh, enough measures on the front end that we actually had funding uh, such that we weren't hit so bad that it put us back into a deficit. So what are we doing now? We're looking at, okay, how do we handle the situation before? And then what measures did we talk about then? Have we, have we taken those measures? Have we looked at energy efficiency? Have we looked at what ways and what uses of our alternative fuel sources that we have? And some things we have to work on, not just on a local level, but again in conjunction with our, our state and federal uh, associates. Uh, looking at the fact that there weren't any um, uh, there weren't any hybrid cars on the state contracting. I don't, I don't know about your states. I know in Mississippi, we typically have to go to the state contracting source first to see what the vehicles are there, and then we, we go from there. Uh, but to look and see, okay, what were the fuel efficient hybrid vehicles that were coming up on state contract? There weren't any. We were looking for these two and three years ago. Uh, what are ways that we don't have to run as much fuel as we had to run two to three years ago? We should always be looking to see what's going to be the next thing that happens so that we don't have to continue to be reactionary, but that we've already started planning for what we know will come, not, not what we're expecting. We've been through these things before. History has shown us this is what will happen every few years in our country. So what things are we looking at and what are we preparing for? And I think that that's one thing as mayors, we do tend to do well. Uh, we have to react to so much that it becomes second nature uh, in a sense to, to look and see, all right, we're going into emergency mode, set up the command post, and let's pull out those plans that everybody was thinking and was dreaming about four or five years ago, and let's put those into practice now. Paul, I think one of the things I think for all of us, we all ran because we want to solve problems in our community and find solutions. What drives us crazy is when we can't be accountable for the things that impact our communities. That's the hardest part. So when we talk about schools, we don't really have, other than Mayor Menino here, a direct um, opportunity in terms of accountability for our schools. Your question was, what frustrates us? It is the things that we're held accountable for that we don't actually have any control over. So my example would be, as mayor of, of Sacramento, California is the eighth largest econ economy in the world. And I'm the mayor of that that's, you know, capital city for California. And what happens each year is the state of California cannot balance its budget. So as mayors, we're all expected to balance our budget. California has a $20 billion <coughs> shortfall over the last couple of years, so year after year. So what California does to get creative is they say, let's take money from the cities up and down the state to balance the budget. So they are robbing Peter to pay Paul, and we have no real protection for that. That is very difficult. California can't balance its budget in part because it has a two-third budget notion to, to pass a budget. So if you don't get two-thirds, you're never going to get a budget passed in California. So they've got to have budget reform. But that, again, comes back and it, our, they balance their budget on the backs of cities. Taking it a step further, California's credit rating is the worst in the country as a state. So then it makes us as a city, puts us in a, in a, in a very awkward position where we're trying to borrow and bond and do some of these things that we typically do. The reason why it's so difficult for Sacramento is we're a capital city. So as a capital city, we get a double whammy. If we as a city have the majority of our jobs or government jobs, and when California can't balance a budget and has to lay off people, that impacts the whole state. But as a capital city, when you start furloughing workers, then our workers don't come downtown and they don't spend money at our shops and our restaurants. So we get a double whammy in terms of of California and Sacramento. The last part, which is strange, so we as a city last year got up and down the League of Cities, we got together and we said we're going to come up with a proposition, Proposition 22. It precludes and prohibits the state of California from taking money from the cities. <coughs> we got it passed, it passed overwhelmingly. That was last year. So this year we thought we were going to benefit from it. Well, what the state did is they said, hmm, let's just eliminate redevelopment agencies now. 
So because they couldn't take money because of this proposition, they decided to eliminate redevelopment, which basically was a loophole and a shenanigan to take monies from the cities to balance them. Those are the things that are make it very difficult for us as mayors. You know, on the subject of mayors being blamed for things uh, that they really don't have <coughs> control over, uh, my uh, mentor, uh, Mayor Kevin White, who I spoke of earlier, always would say to me, Paul, since we're going to be blamed for things that uh, weren't our fault, let's take some credit for the good things we actually didn't do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that works or not. Well, let, me, uh, let me just say, you know, the finance of the city of Boston, we are 28 percent of the gross state revenue. We only get 19 percent back from the state. So we're losing 9 percent of our revenue right there from the state. The local aid formula doesn't work for a capital <coughs> city like Boston. Uh, when we had the crisis a few years ago, what I did was I went to all the unions and asked them for a pay freeze for one year so I could get some revenues into my uh, revenue uh, basket so I could deal with some of the issues. Also, some of my departments I asked to reorganize. And it's interesting when you look at some budgets, and uh, I always pride myself on being pretty good on budgets. I had my public health commission cut it out 10 divisions out of the budget and nobody in the city recognized it. Nobody complained once. Because we as cities have some items in our budget that stay there forever. Because we have an executive director who does nothing at all. But until we get to a crisis stage, that's when we cut these things out. But also what we have done is we've gone to the state and got them to uh, give us some opportunities to raise revenue. A meals tax and a hotel tax. We never had that opportunity before. The only way I was able to uh, finance the city was through uh, real estate taxes, fees and fines, and local aid. You never could figure out what the local aid number would be until probably July, because the state legislature never would pass a budget early on to help out the cities and towns. So as mayor, you have to understand that the budget process is the most important process you have. And I think uh, that I do as mayor, because if your budget works, your city works. And what happens a lot of times in cities, we just, they throw the budget together and just throw it and hope it works. We have to be really um, cognizant of the fact that that's our operating numbers. How do we make sure our police department, our fire department, our schools all have necessary funds to work public works? We, we don't have the frills we had in the past, but we have the schools working, the police department working, the fire department. And I just say to you all that, uh, I just went through where the, uh, my bonding agencies came in three weeks ago, and they gave us AAA on, on one of the companies, one of the bonding agencies, and AA plus on another, even with losing almost $100 million over the last six years from state government. Because I think I have probably, my financial team is probably one of the best in the country, and they know how to make it work. My department heads pay attention when I tell them, you have to cut one or 2% off your budget for next year. We work together. It's always not the, um, some department has a cute, they, uh, they always cut out my favorite programs. <laughs> and what I do all the time is I go over those budgets. I said, why did you cut that budget? Oh, well, it's your favorite budget. They know I'll throw it back in. And so I go back and cut somebody else's budget out. Uh, but, you know, guys, folks, we do face a crisis out there. And I wish the, the, um, the federal government would stop, stop this nonsense about cutting programs Look at what cities do and listen to us and accept some of these programs we have. You know, they, they stop and they say, well, we'll cut out CBDG. Now, CBDG program is a job creation program. It creates affordable housing. So they, they want to cut that out. But there's some other program, bailout programs they won't cut out. Listen to us because we know, all four of us are on the front lines every day. We know what's work. Now listen to us. Accept some of the suggestions we have as mayors on the national level. Because you get down to Washington, they don't listen to us. They speak to us. They don't ask for any give and take. What, what do you think? How can we solve these problems? So stop, look, and listen to our federal government. Be part of the solution. <coughs> don't be part of the problem. I want to ask uh, another question that will shift it a little bit, but also ask you to be thinking about a question you might like to ask one of your fellow panelists uh, as we go forward. And that has to do with uh, the shape of the city. I mentioned in my opening comments that 
uh, <coughs> that in contrast to the 60s and 70s when the cities represented everything that was bad and there was this flight from the cities going on, that significant parts of our population have, have really embraced and shown a preference for the distinctiveness of, of, of urban and, and town life. And I wanted to ask each of you what you're doing to try to build on that, to really enhance that, that urban specialness that seems to be attractive to at least significant segments of the population. Anybody? Well, you know, while some of the recent census numbers, we went up again this time of over 600,000 uh, people who live in our city. First time we've gone over 600,000 since 1970. But during the daytime, we have 1.2 million individuals who work in the city of Boston, one of the few cities that doubles its population. What we're doing, we have with all the 27 colleges and universities around us, we try to make it an attractive place for those young, uh, those graduates to stay. We retain about 46% of those graduates. One in three Bostonians is between the age of 20 and 34. So we're a relatively young city, Boston. People have a perception we're one of the older cities. We're a younger city because of our college and university. That's why our health care, our higher education, our financial services and tourism industry keeps on growing in our city because of the people who live in our city. But also the challenges we have as a city is that the diverse population, how we make them feel like they're part of the mainstream of our city. Over the last several years, we've put 10,000 uh, individuals through an ESL program, so English as a second language, to help them be kind of part of the mainstream of the jobs in the city of Boston. And how do we try, you know, the events we have in our city too attract people to Boston and, uh, you know, and that's part of it, but uh, a climate that works, a friendly climate where everybody wants to work together to make this a city that uh, works for not some of our people, but for all our people. And that's the challenge we face as mayor, to make sure it's a city that's open, acceptable by everyone. That, you know, Boston has a reputation of the 1970s. Paul and I were around in those days. We saw a terrible city then. Boston's a much different city today than it was in the 70s. It's a much more open, a much tolerant, and it's a much more welcoming city than we as mayors excuse me, have to make sure that we have the programs and have the, the, the housing, the neighborhoods have to be strong, where people live, the small business districts, the Main Street program, we have to make sure they work. That's what it is. It's a climate you create in your city where people say, gee, I want to live here, I want to stay here, and education is part of that. Because we make, people make decisions, it's about where do the youngsters go to school. And that's part of the whole criteria of how people stay in the cities and make it exciting. Playgrounds, streets, all those things make a, bar, a city work, and that's what I do as mayor. I believe my colleagues do it every day. Others? Wait. Mayor Coleman? When I first came in, we, we put together a strategic plan, you know, with the, the, the five pillars. It was education, public safety, financial stability, infrastructure, all those things. And when we got to the end of the list, I said, there's just something missing on this. And it really went to what I call the Jimmy the Greek intangible factor which was, you know, what is it that makes cities unique? What is it makes it, that makes them vibrant urban places? And so we added a category just called the soul of the city and said, you know, if you really want to attract, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, people coming back as empty nesters moving back into the city that may have been born and raised there but then left to go out to, to the suburbs to raise their family, how do we get them back? How do we get that vitality back? How do we attract businesses? Uh, so we started really focusing on trying to bring more bars and restaurants and just places to be. Uh, for people in downtown. We started uh, really focusing in on, on, on creating this great jazz festival. It will rival your, your uh, you come in June to my jazz festival, I'll come, come to your blues festival in September. Uh, and, but, you know, those are the things. And, and, and we've seen very directly the payoff as, as some, uh, there was a major corporation that was looking to move out of a suburban community because they were trying to attract talent from across the globe. They were competing against Boston. They were competing against Silicon Valley. They were competing against all kinds of uh, places around the world, and they and they wanted to come to a vibrant community. And so, when when we could show them, not only what we have done, but what we're planning on doing to increase the the, the things that would make a 25, 26 year old graduate from MIT want to come to the city of St. Paul, uh, those became criti critically important selling points. You know, and it's it, it. I think it's one of the frustrations that I have is that people. 
you know, say, you know, you hear this mantra, just focus in on the basics, focus in on the basics. Well, the basics are, are not so basic. There's not just one tool in the toolbox that makes a city a vibrant, healthy place. They've got to be safe. They've got to have jobs. They've got to have great schools. But if there's nothing to do after 5 o'clock, then people are going to be looking elsewhere to locate their businesses because they know that they have to have that kind of activity level. Um, one of the things that we're doing is, is also selling uh, the amenities from a regional perspective. Uh, when I talk about uh, downtown St. Paul is a great place to locate a business, I talk about the fact that in a couple of years you'll be able to get on a light rail line and take it over to Minneapolis and go to a Twins game or go uh, see a Vikings game. Uh, and conversely, they can come over here and go to a, a hockey game or whatever, or a concert at the Excel Energy Center. Uh, so, so part of it is focusing in on the specific things that you're doing in your community, but then understanding how those tie into a more regional perspective of all the activities that you have to sell as a community. Uh, I, my perspective is going to be more from a rural because, uh, again, whereas my colleagues are in large cities, uh, my city is where you guys come to get away from it all. <laughs> uh, still, in, in light of that, the, we've seen a population decline. And it's very simple. We've seen a population decline happen at least since the 70s and 80s because jobs have left. Anytime you have jobs that leave a particular area, of course you're going to have a population that leaves as well. The Mississippi Delta is primarily a minority community. The entire Delta region, this has, this has the, the largest African American population in the entire state of Mississippi, which has the largest African American population in the United States of America. When you've seen the type of uh, job decline that we've seen over the past 30 years, you understand now why we have 40,000 people <coughs> that have left the Mississippi Delta region, almost equivalent to the size of my city. We've got to work on bringing jobs into the community, and that's where we talk about why education is so critically important, why infrastructure is so critically important, so that we can employ people so that they can live in our communities. I think that when we look across the broad scope, we can see that with no offense to the urban areas, there is a trend of people coming to smaller areas um, with the onset of, of broadband infrastructure, with the ease of being able to work from anywhere in the United States as well as the world. Uh, we do see uh, people coming into smaller areas, small communities to live and to do business and to raise their children. There have to be benefits <coughs> there, and that's certainly something that we're working on in our community, providing first that infrastructure to locate the business, but then what are the benefits, the education education, the, uh, the quality of life issues that really matter to a family. We're beginning to see some of our retirees come home. We have, we have a joke, if you're from Mississippi, then if you're from Chicago, then you are related to somebody in Mississippi. <laughs> You just are. <laughs> Chicago is our suburb. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we want those people to come back home. We want them to come back to Mississippi. Uh, we want to see and expand that tourism that makes our culture, our area, so rich. Uh, we talked about the Blues Festival, but there are so many different things that are uh, the life and blood of the Mississippi Delta that people from all over the world want to come and see and experience. Uh, a, a quick example, there is an area right outside of Tunica. How many people know where Tunica, Mississippi is? I mean, okay, a lot of hands, and I mean not just the casinos. <laughs> <laughs> Tunica, Mississippi, 20 years ago was the most impoverished place in the entire state of Mississippi. Today you go and there are 15, uh, 15 casinos up and down the highway. But there, someone came up with an ingenious idea to put these little shotgun houses uh, as a hotel for people to come and stay. Uh, in Tunica, Mississippi, and sure enough, you can go and there's a little <laughs> shotgun house, looks just like something, well, something from where I know, where I grew up around, which some folks say off of television, but it's a little one-room shotgun house complete with newspaper on the wall, uh, complete with the little uh, rod bed. People come and spend $100 a night to sleep in a shotgun house. <laughs> Baffles my mind. 
But the whole idea is there are there's a uniqueness, I think, as it was yes. put, to all of our areas. We have to capture and understand what is it that makes us who we are, and then allow and really encourage the innovativeness of our people such that they can capitalize on their own uniqueness. Paul, and that's what we're working on doing in our area. Sorry, Mary. So Paul, just real simple. So when I played in the NBA, my last year in the NBA um, was 2000. And we were taking a, a, a trip on a team bus. And I asked my teammates, what were their three favorite NBA cities? And they said the three favorite. And I said, what are your three least favorite NBA cities? And their three least favorite NBA cities. Now, they said it. I didn't. I just, <laughs> I'm just past, I'm, don't shoot the messenger. So Salt Lake City, Milwaukee, and Sacramento. And that's my, I was like, oh, Sacramento. So I was like, why Sacramento? And they said, you're the capital of California. <coughs> At 5 o'clock downtown, there's nothing open. How can you be a capital of California and not have any restaurants or shops open past five o'clock? Furthermore, they said we play a game that ends at 10 o'clock and then by the time we get back to the hotel, we have to order room service because you all don't have any restaurants. So the, the irony is, is partly why I ran for mayor is I want to make Sacramento uh, <laughs> you know, not in the bottom tier of NBA cities. But, it's as simple as people are making decisions today, not just on jobs. They want to live in a cool place. At the end of the day, this next generation, the millenniums, they are making decisions on where to live based on cool cities. And I think that's where we're trying to find that balance of, yes, jobs, but culture activities, civic amenities. We have two rivers in Sacramento, two rivers. Anybody here from San Antonio before I say this? <coughs> San Antonio. They are known for a river. It's not a river, it's a canal. <laughs> they, they pump water you know, down this canal and they've marketed it brilliantly as a river walk. We have two rivers and we're doing nothing about it. So there's opportunities that each of us have that are very unique to our communities. Yeah. My, uh, I, uh, my friend Michael uh, Porter at the Harvard Business School uh, has remarked on the current uh, internet revolution when anything can be done from anywhere, the distinctiveness of place matters even more. And I think that's uh, real wisdom. Well, now I'd like to invite you mayors to ask uh, each other some questions. Uh, Mayor Hudson, you have a question for one of your fellow mayors? <laughs> when is that jazz festival again? No, just kidding. Um, Esperanza Spalding. Now she's a star. She started off. Boom. There. Prince got a hold of her. It was all. That's it. That's, that's it. I guess my, my question actually would go to um, my colleague and good friend here from, from Boston. Um, you, you sit in a very unique position of having control over the school board, and I think that's one of the things that was expressed is that some, that's something that a lot of us don't, um, don't have the ability to do. How did you first go about setting what were the priorities that needed to happen within your school system in conjunction with what your constituents were saying needed to happen in the school system? How we got to the appointed school board. My predecessor fought for it. Um, he won it. Then I came into office. There was a sunset clause that said that uh, we had to go before the voters to, uh, to make it permanent. And um, at that time, why, why we got appointed to school board, because we had school crew members who were throwing ash trays at each other, stealing each other's speeches. The school system was in complete disarray. One went to jail. And it was, education was the important thing there. The custodian junior was very important. The teachers union was very important. The kids were the least important part of what was going on in the Boston Public Schools. And so when I got into office, we had the second referendum. And the initial poll we took, I was losing it by 40 points. They said I could not retain the uh, appointed school board. I went to the business community at that time. I said, you raise the money, I'm going to win. The issue in the minority community was we're taking their uh, voting rights away from them. It's a very uh, fragile thing. I had to convince the minority community that we weren't taking their voting rights we were given the rights of children in education. And so by the time we got to the election day, we turned it around, we won it by 40.
because we got a lot of the uh, folks in the community to understand how important this was. It wasn't about taking people's rights, it was about kids. And I just say that um, I was very um, happy with the decision uh, and, I, and uh, we made a lot of pro uh, progress. And uh, you know, but just folks, when you think about public education and public school systems, we take all kids in, ESL kids, handicapped kids, every kid out there who's disenfranchised comes to the Boston Public Schools. And we have to make sure all our schools accept all our kids. You know, and, and I think under, and uh, Paul was one of the fighters with us on it and uh, charter reform, that we'll be able to get all the schools to take all those kids in. I mean, some of the schools, and, uh, and Paul and I have this disagreement at times on this uh, charter school issue, they, they, they choose and pick who they want. But now under the new educational reform bill, they're not going to be able to choose and pick because what they were doing was cherry picking. In April, if a kid wasn't going to graduate, they'd throw him back to the Boston Public Schools. But in June, they'd have a big press conference saying, all that kids graduated from high school, yay, yay, they're going to college. Well, they're back with me again. But I think with our legislation that we fought for and we won, we're going to be able to deal with that issue. And, uh, I'm not saying all of the schools like that. There are some. And you know, like I said earlier in my statement, I don't care if they're charter, public, private, parochial, whatever they may be, it's about the children. It's not about the buildings, it's about the children and how we get those kids educated. And that's all we should be focused on. Forget about all the other nonsense we get involved in. And also, when you think about these kids, what's the longest school day? What do they do at wraparound, um, they mentioned wraparound schools. What do they do in the summertime? What's the programs we have for kids? Because if a kid doesn't have a program in the summertime, they could lose a whole grade by not having any programs in the summertime. So those are part of what we have to do. It's not easy, but I think we all, all mayors want to be involved. We all have a certain degree of it. Some mayors use the bully pulpit. but I'm very fortunate that um, I appoint the school, how it works with the appoint the school board. There's a citizens group that every time there's an appointment up, they give me three names, and I pick out of those three names. Out of the seven members on my school committee, I'll tell you honestly, five of them I didn't know before they walked in the door. I take it very seriously, this appointment of a school committee, and they take it very seriously also. So I think um, that's where we are in this point of the school board. Yeah. Every major city, because it just gets me so frosted when the teachers' union and the custodian unions can run our school system. Mayor Coleman, you have a question for a colleague? Well, first of all, Mayor, I mean, if you're going to run for mayor or governor of Mississippi, when you get to this point in the program, you're supposed to start off by saying, I'm wonderful. I'm just so great. And let me tell you why I'm great. And then, you, then the question is, don't you th agree with me? <laughs> so here's an example. <coughs> so no, I, this is, I'm going to throw this out generally to the, to the group because because there's so much, you know, as, as people that are all engaged, education is the most important thing. So much of the focus right now has been on teachers and teacher accountability, et cetera. But I really kind of have come to a different place on this. And I want to see what others think about this, which is uh, my new phrase is the most important decision in education in America today is who has the parking spot closest to the front of the building. Mm. We spend so much time focusing in on teachers that we kind of let the hook off of principals who have the ability to change the culture of buildings, have the ability to hold teachers accountable more so than any other level of, of uh, leadership. Uh, principals in the city of St. Paul ha in the state of Minnesota have tenure rights, they have the same kind of union rights, but I always kind of am puzzled by that because they're management. When I have a problem in my public works department, uh, filling potholes or something, <coughs> or not filling potholes, uh, you hold the workers accountable, but ultimately you hold the leadership of the department accountable. I have, are you kind of looking at any of ways that we can change the culture of the building? And I'll tell you specifically kind of the moment, the aha moment for me. My daughter's working in City Year in New York. I went into the building that she's working in. There was a building that was about to be closed 10 years ago. They brought in a new principal, completely changed the culture of the building. He was responsible for holding teachers accountable. He was responsible for bringing community into it. Changed the, changed the outcomes of the school. Didn't change the demographics, just changed the outcomes. And I think that we just seem to let that level of leadership just skate by with no accountability. Yeah, I'll, I'll address that. I agree. I think the, and this is a simple formula. 
you cannot have a great school without a great principal. So in Sacramento, we have 100 schools. If I was in charge of schools, I would get 100 great principals, and I know my school district would be one of the best in the country. You give your principal the autonomy to choose his team and pick his team, the autonomy to choose the educational program, the autonomy to figure out how to reward and recognize teachers, the autonomy to hold parents and students accountable, you're going to have an entirely different environment. So a great principal is going to pick great teachers, so you have great teachers in the classroom. Those two are going to create an environment where parents are part of the equation, and that triangular uh, dynamic of those three is certainly important. But you will not have a great school system without great principals. Mm -hmm. And of course, Mayor Menino, uh, the principals used to be unionized in Massachusetts until the 1993 legislation took them out of the out of the union. But how Everybody, about principals? Everybody's unionized in Massachusetts, <laughs> except the mayor. And, uh, Calif and California. In California. Um, we have, the, under the new legislation, we have turnaround schools in the part of the legislation, where some of the underperforming schools, we go in and remove the principal, and the principal has the right to hire the staff and the schools, the teachers and everyone else. And uh, in several of our schools, this year we've had turnaround schools, brought new principals in. Principals are the boss, and they went out and hired new teachers. And I'll tell you, you go into those schools today, talk to the teachers, but talk to the students that have been there for a while, and they'll tell you the atmosphere in the school has changed, there's an educational process going on there, and the kids are enjoying the classroom. With the underperforming principals, the teachers didn't enjoy school. They had a hard time going there. But the new principals we brought in are really making a difference, and you're right. They are the bosses, and they, we have to have the ability of changing those principals in all the schools, and that's we're trying to fight um, uh, with the, the unions, of course, uh, on that. And, uh, you know, the unions are not understanding their, their first obligation should not to be just protecting people. They should also have a, a protection of the educational process. And uh, we in Boston have a very militant uh, teachers union right now, and uh, they're trying to block everything we're trying to do in education. But I just say to them, you know, we'll continue. If I, hey, I, I fought with the firefighters union for five years, and the uh, teachers union fighting with them for the next couple of years, so what? Who cares? We'll get our things done. And, uh, but, you know, unions have to understand, folks, they have a responsibility. They have responsibility to the students and the parents. And it's so unfortunate they don't understand that. They have to be part of the success. I had a previous um, president of the union, Eddie Doherty. Tough guy, but he understood when he had to move on issues. Like he gave us pilot schools early on in my administration, which broke a lot of the management rules. But now we have a president now of the union who says, no, I want to maintain everything I have. I'm not going to give you anything. So yeah, you have this diverse decision-making going on, and the national organization of teachers can't move my president. Mayor Johnson, you have a question for a colleague? Yeah, I think I'm going to ask a question to Mayor Coleman, but I'd like each folks, each of the colleagues really quickly, what is, what's the population of each of your cities and what's the size of your general fund? Mayor Hudson, real quick. Right. Um, my population is slightly under 40,000. Is what? It slightly under 40,000. We're just getting <coughs> our census numbers in that, put, that are putting us roughly um, about 38.5, and we're down from 41,633. And your general fund was? Is uh, roughly 18 to 20 million. Okay. 280 with uh, a $230 million general fund. Okay. Oh, well, um, over 600,000 folks live in our city. Our budget is about $2.4 billion. So you see the size of Boston. So we have, in Sacramento, we have almost 500,000, and we're, our general fund is about 500 million. So each of our cities have different challenges based on the size. Mayor Coleman, here's my quick question for you. Um, you. You talked about regionalism, the Twin Cities. Just give me a thought in terms of what is the competitive advantage that you have in your particular city as you think about a regional approach? Well. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul have been historic rivals. Uh, they fought more than they've gotten along. Uh, probably the most commented upon uh, thing that has happened since I became mayor was everybody saying, well, it's so, it's so nice that you and Mayor Ryback are actually getting along. Uh, and, and just by starting to have a dialogue, starting to look at approaches from a regional perspective, as we've gone out and worked with national funders uh, that have stressed this regionalism piece, um, we really have had an opportunity to, to say, look, at we're, we're, we're not trying to just isolate this piece of the, 
you know, the region or that piece. We're really looking at these strategies on transportation, on housing, on education, on workforce development, et cetera, from a regional perspective. But the, the greatest thing that we have uh, from an asset base, you know, we're a very highly educated <coughs> workforce. We have a lot to sell. We have 21 Fortune 500 companies, more Fortune 5s than, than per capita than any other region. We have all these incredible assets. But instead of selling those assets, we were just trying to say, well, don't look at that side of the river. Just look at this side of the river and, and, and you know, don't pay attention. And all of a sudden, you know, again, the light bulb went on and you said, well, why wouldn't I sell the fact that the Minnesota Twins are in a beautiful new outdoor ballpark 10 miles from downtown St. Paul? That's a heck of an asset. The, 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 the riverfront over Minneapolis and the redevelopment that they've done there, the museums, are, you know, the theaters are some of the best in the country. Uh, if I wasn't selling those assets when I was trying to sell St. Paul, I was missing out on a huge piece of why I like living in that region. So. Um, all of our strategies have really changed and shifted focus. We now have a regional council of mayors, um, bipartisan, nonpartisan. Uh, it is really just saying, let's stop fighting, let's stop competing against each other and start competing against Singapore and, and other parts of the world. Okay, we're about out of time, but we have time for just a, a parting thought from each of you, if you can keep it uh, to a, a minute or uh, less. Mayor Johnson, what would you like to leave us with? I feel a whole lot better today than I did when I first got here. <laughs> and I know if Mayor Menino has a question, he's going to bring up the Boston Celtics. So I want to leave you with this thought. I played in the NBA from 1988 to 2000. You guys didn't win championships during those years. So I used to always like coming to your city during that day. <laughs> Whoa. OK, pal. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, out of this um, conversation we've had this afternoon, I think one of the things is mayors have a difficult job. And, but, you know, it's made easier by folks like yourself out there working with us to solve our problems. And you don't even mention what LISC does for our cities, improving the quality of life in the neighborhoods of Boston. Uh, we just had a resilient uh, neighborhood announcement in Boston. I think that's one of the most creative programs that's come down in a long time. It brings people together, working as one organization to improve some of the most troubled neighborhoods in our city. And the other part of what I like about it is that we met with the staff. They work with us on how we create that resilient community. And that's what this is all about, folks. It's us, in this room, we have a lot of brain power, a lot of uh, experience. If we learn how to work together, the word today should be collaboration, and how we collaborate together to achieve the common goal of making our neighborhoods in our cities a better place to live, not just for some of our people, but all our people. And that's what I hope we all leave here tomorrow, I guess it is, how we all work together. It's so important that we work together to make this a better place, because some other folks don't even care about us anymore. We've got to understand the resources we have, how we use those resources to make it a better place. Thank you. Mayor Coleman, quick thought. Well, I'll expand on that, uh, although I will also say we don't know, we don't have a professional basketball team in Minnesota, so we wouldn't know about that. <laughs> uh, we, uh, oh, yeah. It, that hurts. Yeah, we do, but. Um, so, anyways, to, to make it short, I'll, I'll expand on what Mayor Menino said. And these are, the cities are under assault, like, never before in, in some ways. And, you know, in, in the 70s and the 80s, there was drugs, there was crime, there was all kinds of things. And just when we were starting to figure all that stuff out and really starting to rebuild our communities, now we're being assaulted by congressmen and state legislators and governors. Uh, and it is really unfortunate because I think that we were just at a point uh, where we were really going <coughs> to fundamentally change what was happening in this country in our, uh, you know, for the long term, not, not palliative, but really structural cures to the challenges that our communities were facing. The work that the Brookings Institute uh, was doing to kind of heighten the importance of cities was met with an opposite and equal reaction from the other side that said, let's try to take all the money away from cities. We've got to change that. It is community-based groups that's going to, that are going to help us fight that fight. Uh, and regardless of what happens on the state or the federal level, the work that all of us in this room need to do continues. Uh, we, need, we know how important it is, and we, can't let, uh, we just can't be deterred from our work. Last word, Mayor Hudson. 
LISC has traditionally always worked with <coughs> urban communities. However, here recently, the smaller and rural communities are now being involved. And I'd like to just say thank you. Uh, thank you because even though uh, we are smaller communities, we may not have as large of a budget, we may not have the same population and size, but we do have many similar problems. And I certainly hope that after this conversation today, not only do we understand each other better, but that we understand that we can learn from each other. Urban communities can learn from rural communities. Rural communities can learn from urban communities. And together, we can collaborate to understand better the issues that uh, our people deal with and understand how better to solve them. Uh, good and powerful things come out of small places. And certainly. <laughs> Certainly, I, I appreciate well, Liz for understanding that, and I thank Liz for involving us in the conversation. Well, we've talked candidly about the problems and challenges, but I think we can all agree with four leaders uh, like this, there is every reason to be optimistic. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs>